Hello everyone and welcome. This is Jörg once again from YouTube channel Jogler 66 with another reading of Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow. I'm sorry it's been quite some time since my last upload on this, but I've been busy with Rulers of Evil and uh, also the German reading of uh, the two Babylons from Alexander Hislop. And therefore you had to wait almost a month for another part. I hope that I will get a little bit faster through the rest of the book right now. But today we are here to read chapter 5 of Babylon Mystery Religion that is called Obelisks, Temples and Towers, Symbols of S.U.N. Baal, Sun Worship. So without any further delay, we start reading. Among the ancient nations, not only were statues of the gods and goddesses in human form made, other objects with a hidden or mystery meaning, such as obelisks, were a part of heathen worship. Diodorus spoke of an obelisk 130 feet high that was erected by Queen Semiramis in Babylon. Now it's interesting to learn a little bit of who Diodorus was. So I'm going to give you a little bit more insight and what the obelisk of Semiramis was about. Diodorus Siculus, or Diodorus of Sicily, was a Greek historian. He is known for writing the monumental universal history Bibliotheca Historica, much of which survives between 60 and 30 BC. It is arranged in three parts. The first part covers the mystic history up to the destruction of Troy, arranged geographically, describing regions around the world from Egypt, India and Arabia to Greece and Europe. The second part covers the Trojan War to the death of Alexander the Great. And the third covers the period to about 60 BC. The title Bibliotheca, meaning library, acknowledges that he was drawing on the work of many other authors. Now, to the obelisk. Semiramis carried out a stone from the mountains of Armenia, which was 130 feet long and 25 feet wide and thick. And this he hauled, she hauled by means of many multitudes of yokes and mules and oxen to the river, and there loaded it on a raft, on which she brought it down to the stream to Babylonia. She then set it up beside the most famous street, an astonishing sight to all who pass by. And this stone is called by some an obelisk from its shape, and they number it among the seven wonders of the world. It's an interesting read, I can assure you, to go a little bit into uh, Diodorus Siculus, and therefore I will put some links into the description box of the video that I've looked up, and you can do that for yourself to go into his work, what was mentioned here, the um, Bibliotheca Historica. Very interesting to do a little bit study on that. But okay, the author mentioned, so this Diodorus spoke of an obelisk 130 feet high that was erected by Queen Semiramis in Babylon. The Bible mentions an obelisk type image, an obelisk type image, approximately 9 feet in breadth and 90 feet high. Quote, the people fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up in Babylon. As we can read in Daniel 3 verse 17, the author claims. So I looked it up and we read in Daniel 3 verse 7, not 17, quote, Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, all nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Unquote. Now what does this have to do with the mentioned obelisk, I do not understand, because from Daniel 3 verse 1 we read the following measurement. Quote, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Unquote. So, the measurements, what I just read, are correct, because a cubit is a one feet and a half. And the Bible, once again, of course, is correct too, and here even confirmed by a heathen. But the statue should be an image of the king, not an obelisk. So, 
when reading this book here, I keep to the Bible, and the statue is an image of the king, and the obelisk is 130 feet, as mentioned before, then the same size, but brought there by Semiramis, not Nebuchadnezzar. So the author continues, but it was in Egypt, as we all know, an early stronghold of the mystery religion, that the use of the obelisk was best known. Many of these obelisks are still in Egypt, but some have been moved to other nations. One is in Central Park in New York, another in London, while others are transported to Rome, and also to Paris and other cities. So he leaves out a lot of cities, but when you look around the world, there are obelisks everywhere, really everywhere. Now, originally, the obelisk was associated with S.U.N. sun worship. The ancients, having rejected the knowledge of the true creator, as always, they turn away from the creator and rather worship the creation, seeing that the sun, S.U.N., gave life to plants and to man, looked upon the sun, S.U.N., as a god, the great life-giver. To them, upright objects, such as the obelisk, also had a sexual significance. Realizing that through sexual, sexual union life was produced, the phallus was considered, along with the S.U.N. the sun, a symbol of life. These were beliefs represented by the obelisks. And we can go even much deeper into that, because I refer here, when, you, when we are reading, realizing that through sexual union life was produced, I like to refer here to my reading of the Book of Rulers of Evil, chapter 21 and chapter 22. And when you read that, you get the obsession with sex in the mystery schools and Roman Catholic religion, where they are convinced that these satanic sexual rituals give them power and with wisdom. Power and wisdom through satanic sexual rituals. And then when you look at a little bit up on YouTube and in the internet and go into satanic rituals, you will always see that they are sex connected and it's all about power and about wisdom because they are getting enlightened by the and they get illuminated by the enlightened one, you see? This all goes really back to this. So this is a very, very significant text, I think, in the books, that realizing that through sexual union life was produced, what do they make out of it? Satanic sexual rituals that, for them, give power and wisdom. So the author continues, the largest upright phallus of the sun in the world is the George Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., capital of the United States of America. I'm very sorry that I have to correct the author here, and I will read to you why. The San Jacinto Monument is a 567.31 foot high column, located on the Houston Ship Channel in unincorporated Harris County, Texas, United States, near the city of Houston, the San Jacinto Monument. The monument is topped with a 220-ton pentagram. You know what a pentagram is, right? The downward five-pointed star that commemorates the site of the Battle of San Jacinto the decisive battle of the Texas Revolution. The monument, constructed between 1936 and 1939, and dedicated on April 21, 1939, is the world's tallest masonry column and is part of the San Jacinto Battleground State Historic Site. By comparison, the Washington Monument is 554.612, meaning, let's say, 555 feet, which is approximately 169 meters tall. The column is an octagonal shaft topped with a 34-foot or 10-meter diameter Lone Star pentagram, the symbol of Texas. Visitors can take an elevator to the monument's observation deck for a view of Houston. And I will put my source where I got that from here, but I knew already before that the Washington Monument is not the largest upright fellas sun worship 
monument. So the author is wrong here. And that's why you always have to check your sources. You can even check me. I don't care. I do my research and I don't say that everything is right, but up to now, I'm quite satisfied with the truth that I find. Now, going back to the George Washington Monument, there is something else very, very interesting about it, as we read in the next sentence. Its dimensions of the George Washington Monument at its base is 55.5 feet wide by 55.5 feet long, with a height of 555 feet. Now, guess what the sum total is when you add up those three dimensions. 55.5 feet plus 55.5 feet plus 555 feet. Do your own math. The word images in the Bible is translated from several different Hebrew words. One of these words, matzibah, means standing images or obelisks. And now follow a few King James Bible quotes that deal with matzibah, standing images or obelisks. First we read in 1 Kings 14 verse 23, quote, uh, I start in verse 22. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their signs which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them, in, uh, built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Unquote. In 2 Kings verse 18, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4, we read, quote, "He removed the high places and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan." Unquote. In 2 Kings 23 verse 14, we read, quote, and he brake in pieces the images, and cut down the groves, and filled their places with the bones of men. Now in Jeremiah 43, verse 14, we read, quote, He shall break also the images of Bethimesh, that is in the land of Egypt, and the houses of the gods of the Egyptians shall, be burn, shall he burn with fire. Unquote. And finally in Micah 5, verse 13, we read, Quote, thy graven images also I will cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. Unquote. Now the author continues another word next to Matzibah, what we were just explaining, is Hamanim, which means S-U-N, sun images, images dedicated to the S-U-N, sun obelisks, and for confirmation we can read in Isaiah 17, verse 8, quote, And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. And in Isaiah 27, verse 9, finally we read, quote, By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sins when he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the groves and images shall not stand up. Unquote. Now the author continues, In order to, for the obelisks to carry out their intended symbolism, they were placed upright, erect. Thus they pointed up toward the sun. As a symbol of the phallus, the erect position also had an obvious significance. Bearing this in mind, it is interesting to notice that when divine judgment was pronounced against this false worship, it was said that these images or obelisks shall not stand up, but would be cast down, as I just read to you in Isaiah 27, verse 9. When the Israelite mixed heathen worship into their religion in the days of Ezekiel, 
they erected an image of jealousy in the entry of the temple, as we can read in Ezekiel 8, verse 5. Quote, then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now towards, toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes and the way towards the north, and behold, northward, at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. Unquote. This image was probably an obelisk, the symbol of the phallus, for, as Schofield says, they were, quote, given over to phallic cults, unquote. Placing an obelisk at the entrance of an heathen temple was, apparently, not an uncommon practice at the time. One stood at the entrance of the temple of Tum, and another in front of the temple of Hathor, the, quote, unquote, abode of Horus, which stands for Tammuz. Now, interestingly enough, there is also an obelisk at the front of St. Peter's in Rome, as the photograph shows on page 34, that I will put the picture here in the video. It is not a mere copy of an Egyptian obelisk. It is the very same obelisk that stood in Egypt in ancient times. Even more interesting, there is one positioned in front of the capital in Washington, D.C., uh, the Washington Monument, as we already spoke about. When the mystery religion came to Rome in the sun worship days, not only were obelisks made and erected at Rome, but obelisks of Egypt, at great expense, were hauled there and erected by the emperors. Caligula, in 37 to 41 AD, had the obelisks now at the Vatican brought from Heliopolis, Egypt, to the circus on the Vatican Hill, where now stands St. Peter's. Heliopolis is but the Greek name of Betshemesh, which was the center of Egyptian S.U.N. sun worship in olden days. In the Old Testament, these obelisks that stood there are mentioned as the images of Betshemesh. And for confirmation we read in Jeremiah 43, um, as I read earlier, you know, here it comes again, and we have more proof, as we, needed, as we needed any proof, that the Bible is the correct history of the world. Because I read Jeremiah 43, 13 again. So, images of Bethshemesh, quote, He shall break also the images of Bethshemesh, that is in the land of Egypt, and the house of the gods of the Egyptians shall he burn with fire. You know, some minutes ago I read that, so here it came again. Now the author continues, The very same obelisk that once stood at the ancient temple, which was the center of Egyptian sun worship, now stands before the mother church of Roman Catholicism. Do you get where this book is going to? How can Roman Catholicism call itself? Christianity, <laughs> when it imports from the center of Egyptian sun worship, the obelisk. This seems more like more than a mere coincidence. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, dear reader, it is no mere coincidence that the largest obelisk in the world, I mean, the second largest obelisk in the world, stands before the capital in Washington, D.C. in the United States of America. We've learned that the Jacinto Monument is the largest, so it is the second largest obelisk, stands in Washington, D.C. So you have a real Egyptian obelisk standing in St. Peter's, and you have the second largest obelisk in the world standing in the capital in Washington, D.C., in the capital of the United States of America. This is not a coincidence, because people, there are no coincidences. Everything is under control of God, whether we like it or not. The red granite obelisk of the Vatican is itself 83 feet high, which is 132 feet high with its foundation, and it weighs 320 tons. In 1586, in order to center it in front of the church in St. Peter's Square, it was moved to its present location by order of Pope Sixtus V. 
Of course, moving this heavy obelisk, especially in those days you can imagine more than 400 day years ago, was a very difficult task. Many movers refused to attempt the feat, especially, listen, since the Pope had attached the death penalty if the obelisk was dropped and broken. So, <laughs> yeah, if I wasn't was an uh, entrepreneur at that time, I would have declined the order, I think. <laughs> I would have declined it anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Finally, a man by the name of Domenico Fontana accepted the responsibility. With 45 winches, 160 horses and a crew of 800 workmen, the task of moving began. The date was September 10th, 1586. Multitudes crowded the extensive square. While the obelisk was being moved, the crowd, upon penalty of death, was required to remain silent. But after the obelisk was successfully erected, there was the sound of hundreds of bells ringing, the roar of cannons, and the loud cheers of the multitude. The Egyptian idol was dedicated to the quote-unquote cross. The cross on top of the obelisk is supposed to contain a piece from the original cross they tell you. Mass was celebrated and the Pope pronounced a blessing on the workmen and horses. The drawing to the left, which I show you now in the video here, shows the pattern of St. Peter's and the circular court in front of it. At the center of the court stands the obelisk. This court is bordered by 248 Doric columns a style that was commonly used in the design of SUN sun worship temples. And not to forget something that the author doesn't mention here, that is the mark of Anuk, the eight-spoke sun wheel in the center of the piazza. Have a close look and you will see the eight spokes of the sun wheel, the sign of, of the mark of Anuk, as you can read in Rulers of Evil. But like the obelisk, SUN sun worship columns were sometimes regarded as mystery forms of the phallus. In the vestibule of the SUN sun worship temple of the goddess at Hierapolis, an inscription reads, quote, I, Dionysus, dedicated this phalli to Hera, my stepmother, unquote. Even as Roman Catholic leaders borrowed other ideas from SUN sun worship, it is no surprise that building elaborate and expensive temples also became the custom. Worldly-minded leaders thought they should build a temple of greater splendor than those of the Roman religion. We know that God directed his people under the rulership of Solomon to build a temple in the Old Testament and choose to, his, uh, to put his presence there. But in the New Testament it is clear that the Holy Spirit no longer dwells in temples made with man's hands. So why should we even go to the so-called church, which is a temple of worship, when the Holy Spirit does not dwell there anymore? <sighs> it is clear that the Holy Spirit no longer dwells in temples made with man's hands, as we can read in Acts 17.24, now I'm going to read to you a little more, not only Acts 17, verse 24, but I'm going to read 20 through through 31. Quote, <laughs> let's start at the beginning. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by, and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with man's hand, men's hands, as though he, he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one all uh, and, uh, and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth that hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, 
that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much, then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. But that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Unquote. So now God dwells in his people, his true church, by the Spirit, says Paul, as we can read in 1 Corinthians 3.16 and the following. Quote, Knowing ye, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Unquote. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16, through what I've just read, is also very, very much fitting into a lot of other discussions about the Bible when you when you read that um, let no man deceive himself if any man a man seems to be wise in his world, let him become a fool that he may be wise for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God that is an interesting sentence, right, in verse 19 for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God what are, be, uh, what are we being taught all our life? We are taught the wisdom of this world when we go to school and universities because the Bible has been taken out of those learning institutions. We are just indoctrinated with so-called wisdom of this world which is foolishness with God. Okay, we continue. Understanding this grand truth, the early church, filled with the Spirit, never went forth to build temples of stone and steel. They went forth to preach the gospel. Their time was not spent in fin financial drives and oppressive pledges in order to build a, fa a fancier building than a temple down the street. According to Heller's Bible Handbook, we do not have any record of a church building as such being built prior to estimated between 222 and 235 AD. That makes absolute sense since it took quite a while for the early churches to get corrupted. So, no church building as such built prior to at least 220 AD. That is 190 years after the crucifixion. There, the church still was real true. But this is not to suggest it is wrong to have church buildings. Well, <clears throat> that's the author's opinion. I, on the other hand, happen to disagree. There is no need for it, since Every house can be used as a gathering place for fellowship and worship. It needs no steeple, which is just an obelisk sexual roof, for any other special design windows, rooms or anything. There is no need for that. So he says, this is not to suggest 
it is wrong to have church buildings, and I tell you it is because church buildings, as we see them all over the world today, are full of idols, starting with the cross, starting with the steeple roof. They are full of idols. So I suggest it is wrong to have church buildings. There is no need for it because every house can be used as a gathering place for fellowship. Because Jesus said, Wherever two or three of you are gathered together, in their midst I will dwell. Meaning, you don't have to go with 50 or 100 or a few hundred people even to a church. You can have your communion and you can have your church in your own home. Have the Bible there and invite the Holy Spirit and that is what church is all about. But okay, the author continues, probably the reason they were not built earlier was because of the first Christians, enduring persecutions, were not allowed to own title to property. But had they been allowed this privilege, we feel certain that such buildings would have been built simply not for outward show. They would not have tried to compete with the extensive styling of the heathen temples of splendor like the Temple of Diana at Ephesus or the Pantheon of Rome. But when the church came to political power and wealth under the reign of Constantine, the, the church didn't come to political power, it was the political power that garned itself with the garment of Christianity. That's a very, very big difference here. But the author said, when the church came to political power and wealth under the reign of Constantine, a pattern for building elaborate and expensive church buildings was set and has continued to this day. Oh yeah, when you look around, you will see a lot of very expensive churches. The idea has become so implanted in the minds of people, <laughs> like so many things have been implanted in the minds of people by the Roman Catholic Church, that the word church to most people means a building and not a congregation, a communion, a gathering, an ecclesia, what it actually means. But in its biblical use, the word refers to an assembly of group of people who are themselves the temple of the Holy Spirit. My point that I was making all way long. As strange as it may sound, a church building could be totally destroyed, and yet the actual church, the people, remain. Well, here I agree with the author, I couldn't have said it any better. Matthew 18, verse 20, quote, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, unquote. That is true Ecclesia. That is the true Church of God. On page 38, the author continues, The majority of expensive church buildings that have been built over the centuries have featured a tower. Each generation of church builders has copied the former generation, probably never questioning the origin of the idea. Some towers have cost fortunes to build. They have added no spiritual value. Jesus, of course, never built such structures when he was on earth, nor did he give any instructions for them to be built after his departure. Now notice the many towers in the Cathedral of Cologne that you see in the picture in the video right here. How, then, did this tower tradition in church architecture begin? The use of towers is also carried out in Christendom, Catholic and Protestant. The tower of the Great Cathedral of Cologne rises 515 feet above the street, while that of the Cathedral of Ulm in Germany is 528 feet high. Even small chapels often have a tower of some kind. It is a tradition that is seldom questioned. If the reader will permit us a certain liberty at this point, we will suggest a theory which points back to Babylon, 
I also referred to the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop because Rome has its origin in Babylon. Of course we all remember the Tower of Babel. The people said, quote, let us make brick. Let us build a city and a tower whose top many reach unto heaven, may reach unto heaven, unquote, as we can read in Genesis 11, verses 3 and 41. The expression, quote unquote, unto heaven, is no doubt a figure of speech for great height, as was also the case when cities with walls that reached up to heaven are mentioned, as we can read in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28, quote, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Unquote. We are not supposed we are not to suppose those Babel builders intended to build clear up into heaven of God's throne. Instead, there is, a, uh, there is sufficient evidence to show that the tower, commonly called a ziggurat, was connected with their religion with some Baal worship. Ziggurat, what does that stand for? In ancient Mesopotamia, a rectangular stepped tower, sometimes surmounted by a temple. Ziggurats are first attested in the late 3rd millennium BC and probably inspired the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, as we can read in Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9. Stepped pyramids, known as ziggurats, survive from the 3rd millennium BC in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Now, of all the lofty monuments of Babylon, the towering ziggurat must certainly have been one of the most spectacular constructions of its time, rising majestically above its huge encircling wall of a thousand towers, around the vast square chambers that were, uh, were set aside for pilgrims, as well as for the priests who looked after the ziggurat. Coldway, this is the historian, called this collection of buildings the quote-unquote Vatican of Babylon. It has been suggested that one of the meanings of the name of the goddess Astarte, who is Semiramis, written as Ashtart, A-S-H-T-T-A-R-T, Ashtart, means the woman that made towers. The goddess Sibylle, who has also been identified with Semiramis, as we have learned already, was known as the tower-bearing goddess. The first, says Ovid, an historian, that erected towers in cities and was represented with a tower-like crown on her head, as was also Diana. In the symbolism of the Catholic Church, a tower is emblematic of the Virgin Mary. Does all of this somehow connect? Yes, it all connects back to some Baal worship. Some ancient towers, as we all know, were built for military purposes, for watchtowers. But many of the towers that were built in Babylonian Empire were exclusively religious towers connected with the temple. In those times, a stranger entering a Babylonian city would have no difficulty locating its temple, we are told, for high above the flat-roofed houses, its tower could be seen. And the Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, It is a striking fact that most Babylonian cities possessed a temple tower. Unquote. It, is it possible that Babylon, as with other things we have mentioned, could have been the source for religious towers? We recall it, <coughs> we recall that it was while they were building the huge Tower of Babel that the dispersion began. It is certainly not impossible that as men mi migrated to various lands, they took the idea of a tower with them. Though these towers have developed into different forms in different countries, yet the towers in one form or another remained. Towers have long been an established part uh, of the religion of the Chinese, for example. The pagoda, linked with the word goddess, at Nankin, is also a picture that you will see here, showed to the left are three pagodas of Dali Yanan. 
and in the Hindu religion, scattered above the large temple enclosures are great pagodas, or towers, rising high above the surrounding country. Everywhere they could be seen by the people, and thus their devotion to their idolatrous worship was increased. Many of these pagodas are several hundred feet high, and are covered with sculptures representing scenes in the lives of the gods in the temple, or eminent saints." Unquote. Among the Muslims, though, in a different form, can be seen the towers of their religion. The above picture that I will put in the video right here shows the numerous towers called minarets at Mecca. Towers of the same style were used on the famous church of St. Sophia at Constantinople, which is the next picture that I will put in the video here. Now, at the top of many church towers, a spire often points to the sky. Several white writers link, and perhaps not without some justification, the steeples and spires with the ancient obelisk. There is evidence, says one, to show that the spires of our churches owe their existence to the uprights and, or, or obelisks outside the temples of former ages. Unquote. Another says, are still in existence today remarkable specimens of original phallic symbols. Steeples on the churches and obelisks all show the influence of our phallus worshipping ancestors. Now on page 41 I continue in chapter 6 which is called Is the cross a Christian or a sun worship symbol? The cross is recognized as one of the most important symbols of the Roman Catholic Church. It is displayed on top of roofs and towers. It is seen on altars, furnishings and ecclesiastical garments. The floor plan of the majority of Catholic churches is laid out in the shape of the cross. Catholic homes, hospitals and schools have the cross adorning the walls. Everywhere the cross is outwardly honored and adored in hundreds of ways. When an infant is sprinkled, the priest makes the sign of the cross upon its forehead, saying, quote, Receive the sign of the cross upon thy forehead. Unquote. During confirmation, the candidate is signed with a cross. On Ash Wednesday, ashes are used to make a cross on the forehead. When Catholics enter in holy water, touch the forehead, <coughs> So when Catholics enter in holy water, touch the forehead, the chest, the left and the right shoulder, thus tracing the figure of the cross. The same sign is made before eating meals. During Mass, the priest makes the sign of the cross 16 times and blesses the altar with a cross sign 30 times. Protestant churches, for the most part, do not believe in making the sign of the cross with their fingers. Neither do they bow down before crosses or use them as objects of worship. Well, I don't know if that is so correct today anymore. <laughs> I think that a lot of Protestant churches do that today because they are more and more infiltrated by the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic belief system is more and more introduced into the Protestant churches today. But at least here they acknowledge that they do not bow down before crosses because what did God say in the second commandment? Do not make any idols of anything that is in heaven or on earth and the waters beneath the earth and do not bow down to them and worship them. So at least the author acknowledges here that Protestantism does not use images and idols as the Roman Catholic Church does. But they have recognized that these things, the Protestants, have rec recognized that these things are unscriptural and superstitious. Well, they had that at that time, but they don't know that anymore today, because also the Protestant seminaries are infiltrated by Jesuits, and spiritual exercises and Roman Catholic doctrine is taught in there today, 2016, and for the last 50 years after the starting of the ecumenical movement with Vatican II in the 1960s. But the use of the cross has been commonly retained on steeples, on pulpits and in various other ways as a form of decoration. 
the early Christians did not consider the cross on which Jesus died a virtuous symbol, but rather as the accursed tree, a device of death and shame, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, quote, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Unquote. They did not trust in an old rugged cross. Instead, their faith was in what was accomplished on the cross. And through this faith, they knew the full and complete forgiveness of sin. It was in this sense that the apostles preached about the cross and gloried it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, we read, quote, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Unquote. They never spoke of the cross as a piece of wood one might hang from a little chain around his neck or carry in his hand as a protector or charm, which is idolism. It's idolatrous and superstitious religion to carry a cross around your neck or in your hand as a protector for charm. Such use of the cross came later. Well, just my opinion here, is that using the cross in any way, shape or form is a form of idolatry, when you remember the second commandment. I think I made that point quite clear right now. It was not until Christianity began to become like S.U.N. Sun Worship, or, as some prefer, S.U.N. Sun Worship was Christianized, very important point, it was not until Christianity began to become like Sun Worship, or Sun Worship was Christianized, that the cross image came to be thought of as a Christian symbol. It was in 431 AD that crosses in churches and chambers were introduced, while the use of crosses on steeples did not come until about 586 AD. In the 6th century, the crucifix image was sanctioned by the Church of Rome. So, the Church of Rome is the synagogue of Satan, is the Church of Antichrist. The 6th century, the crucifix image was sanctioned by the Church of Rome, so we know that sanctifying the crucifix image is of Antichrist. We know that, so don't use it. But it was not until the Second Council at Ephesus that private homes were even required to possess a cross. If the cross is a Christian symbol, if the cross is a Christian symbol, it cannot be correctly said that its origin was within Christianity, for in one form or another it was a sacred symbol long before the Christian era and among many non-Christian people. According to an expository dictionary of New Testament words, it originated among the Babylonians of ancient Chaldea. Quote, the ecclesiastical form of a, <coughs> of a two-beamed cross had its origin in ancient Chaldea and was used as a symbol of the god Tammuz, being the shape of the mystic Tau, T-A-U, Tau, the initial, the T of his name, Tammuz, T, Tau. In that country and in adjacent lands, including Egypt, in order to increase the prestige of the apostate ecclesiastical system, S.U.N. sun worshippers were received into the churches apart from regeneration by faith and were permitted largely to retain their S.U.N. sun worship signs and symbols. Hence, the Tor or T 
in its most frequent form, with the cross piece lowered, was adapted to stand for the cross of Christ. Unquote. In any book on Egypt that shows the old monuments and walls of ancient temples, one can see the use of the Tau cross. The pictures to the left and right that I will put in the video right here shows Amon, the Egyptian god, holding a Tau cross. Says a noted historian in reference to Egypt, quote, Here unchanged for thousands of years we find among her most sacred hieroglyphics the cross in various forms. But the one known especially as the cross of Egypt or the Tau cross is shaped like the letter T, often with a circle or ovoid above it. Yet this mystical symbol was not peculiar to this country, but was reverenced among the Chaldeans, Phoenicians, Mexicans and every ancient people in both hemispheres." Unquote. As the cross symbol spread to various nations, its use developed in different ways. Among the Chinese, quote, the cross is acknowledged to be one of the most ancient devices. It is portrayed upon the walls of their pagodas. It is painted upon the lanterns used to illuminate the most sacred recesses of their temples. Unquote. Illumination and cross together. Is that Christianity, I ask of you? <laughs> the cross has been a sacred symbol in India for centuries among non-Christian people. Among non-Christian people, because there are also Christian people in India, but among non-Christian people, it has been a sacred symbol in India for centuries. It has been used to mark the jars of holy water taken from the Ganges River, also as an emblem of disembodied Jaina saints. In the central part of India, two crude crosses of stone have been discovered, which date back centuries before the Christian era, one of over 10 feet, the other of over 8 feet high. The Buddhists and numerous other sects of India mark their followers on the head with the sign of the cross. On the continent of Africa, at Susa, natives plunge a cross into the river Gitch. The Kabyle women, although Mohammedans, tattoo a cross between their eyes. In Wanyamwizi, walls are decorated with crosses. The Yareks, who established a line of kingdoms from the Niger to the Nile, had an image of a cross painted on their shields. Now, when the Spaniards first landed in Mexico, quote, they could not suppress their wonder, says Prescott. As they beheld the cross, the sacred emblem of their own faith, raised as an object of worship in the temples of Anahuac. The Spaniards were not aware that the cross was the symbol of worship of the highest antiquity by SUN sun worshipped nations, on whom the light of Christianity had never shone. Unquote. In Palenque, Mexico, founded by Wotan in the 9th century before the Christian era, is a heathen temple known as the Temple of the Cross. There inscribed on an altar slab is the central cross six and a half by eleven feet in size. The Catholic Encyclopedia includes a photograph of this cross beneath which are the words Pre-Christian Cross of Palenque. In olden times, the Mexicans worshipped a cross as Tota, our father. This practice of addressing a piece of wood with the title Father is also mentioned in the Bible. Now pay very good attention. When the Israelites mixed idolatry with their religion, they said to a stock, Thou art my father, as we can read in Jeremiah 2, verse 27. Now I have to extend this a little bit, because this is really, really something you have to get. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 27, quote, Saying to a stock, Thou art my father, 
and to a stone thou hast brought me forth for they have turned their back unto me and not their face but in the time of their trouble they will say arise and save us unquote so starting with a quote saying to a stock thou art my father stock meaning stick piece of wood but then here comes the very very important sentence that I want to share with you my brothers and sisters and to a stone thou hast brought me forth what is the world teaching through the evolution theory that it rained for millions and millions and millions of years on a stone and like this all of a sudden from that rain on a stone for millions and millions of years there came life and the Bible states here that they are saying, saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. The roots of the evolutional teaching we have today can be found in the Bible. The true preserved word of God. Isn't that fantastic? They teach that all over the world, that man comes from rain on a stone for millions and millions of years and exactly the same expression is found in the Bible. This to me is a wonderful example of where the teaching of evolution comes from. Like always, the mountain of lies has its foundation in a little coral of sand that's on the basis of all the lies and to a stone thou hast brought me forth yeah when already since ages you preach that you teach that in paganism then it is no wonder that you understand now where the evolutionist theory got that from On the bottom of page 44, the author continues, But it is contrary to the scriptures to call a piece of wood or a priest by the title Father. Of course, as you can read in Matthew 23, verse 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Ages ago in Italy, before the people knew anything of the arts of civilization, they believed in the cross as a religious symbol. It was regarded as a protector and was placed upon tombs. Roman coins of 46 BC show Jupiter holding a long scepter terminating in a cross. The Vestal Virgins of SUN Sun Worship in Rome wore the cross suspended from their necklaces, as the nuns of the Roman Catholic Church do now. The Greeks depicted crosses on the headband on their god corresponding to Tammuz of the Babylonians. Porcelli mentions that Isis was shown with a cross in her fo on her forehead. Her priests carried processional crosses in their worship for her, of her. The temple of Seraphis in Alexandria was surmounted by a cross. The temple of the Sphinx, when it was unearthed, was found to be cruciform in shape. And signs in the form of a cross were carried by the Persians during their battles with Alexander the Great in 335 BC. The cross was used as a religious symbol by the Aborigines of South America in ancient times. Newborn children were placed under its protection against evil spirits. The Patagonians tattooed their foreheads with crosses. Ancient pottery in Peru has been found that is marked with the cross as a religious symbol. Monuments show that Assyrian kings wore crosses suspended on their necklaces, as did some of the foreigners that battled against the Egyptians. Crosses were also figured on the robes of the Rotno as early as the 15th century, before 
the Christian era, 15th century before the Christian era. The Catholic Encyclopedia acknowledges that, quote, the sign of the cross represented in its simplest form by a crossing of two lines at right angles greatly antedates, means predates, in both the East and the West, the introduction of Christianity. It goes back to a very remote period of human civilization. But since Jesus died on the cross, some question, does, does this not make it a Christian symbol? Is it true that in most minds the cross has now come to be associated with Christ? That's true. But those who know its history and the superstitious ways it has been used, especially in past centuries, can see another side of the coin. Though it sounds crude, someone uh, has asked, Suppose Jesus had been killed with a shotgun. Would this be any reason to have a shotgun hanging from our necks or on top of the church roof? It comes down to this. The important thing is not what, but who. Who it was that died, not what the instrument of death was. St. Ambrose made a valid point when he said, quote, Let us adore Christ, our King, who hung upon the wood, not the wood, unquote. Meaning, let us adore Christ, our King, who hung upon the wood. Let us not adore the wood, which is, of course, an idol. Crucifixion as a method of death was used in ancient times as a punishment for flagrant crimes in Egypt, Assyria, Persia, Palestine, Carthage, Greece and Rome. Tradition ascribes the invention of the punishment of the cross to a woman, the Queen Semiramis. All roads lead to Rome. Christ died on one cross, whatever type it was, and yet many kinds of crosses are used in the Catholic religion. A few of the different types are shown here, in the picture that I put up right now. A page in the Catholic Encyclopedia shows 40 different crosses. If the Catholic use of the cross began simply with the cross of Christ and was not influenced by S.U.N. sun worship, why are so many different types of crosses used? Says a noted writer, quote, Of the several varieties of the cross still in vogue, as national and ecclesiastical emblems, distinguished by the familiar appellations of St. George, St. Andrew, the Maltese, the Greek, the Latin, etc., there is not one amongst them, the existence of which may not be traced to the remotest iniquity. Unquote. The cross known as the Tau cross was widely used in Egypt. Quote, in latter times, the Egyptians, the Egyptian Christians, Copts or Coptic Christians, also called still today, attracted by its form and perhaps by its symbolism, adopted it as the emblem of the cross. What is known as the Greek cross was also found on Egyptian monuments. This form of the cross was used in Phrygia, where it adorned the tomb of Medias. Now we go a little bit into Phrygia. A little knowledge on Phrygia. What is Phrygia? Phrygia was a district in the kingdom of Pergamum. We remember Pergamum. It was the middle point of the in the transfer of Babylonian religion, religion westward to Rome. Phrygia is a Greek word meaning freeman. And our English word free comes from the first syllable phry from Phrygia. F-H-R-Y. Phrygian caps were given to freed Roman slaves to indicate their new liberated status. Roman law regards liberty as a conditional status. This is a quote from Rulers of Evil, page 258, and I will insert a link on the Wikipedia search to Phrygian cap also here in the video that you can get a better understanding of that. Here you see how far that goes away. This form of the cross was used in Phrygia, where it adorned the tomb of Midas already. And Phrygia was from Pergamum. 
Among the ruins of Nineveh, a king is shown wearing a Maltese cross on his chest. The form of the cross that is today known as the Latin cross was used by the Etruscans, as seen on ancient sun-worshipped tomb with winged angels to each side of it. Among the Cumas in South America, what has been called St. Andrew's Cross was regarded as a protector against evil spirits. It appeared on the coins of Alexander Bala in, the Syria, uh, in Syria in 146 BC and on those of Bactrian kings about 140 to 120 BC, long before St. Andrew was ever born. The cross which we show here is today called the Calvary Cross, yet this drawing is from an ancient inscription in, Thess uh, in Thessaly, which dates from a period prior to the Christian era. So how can that be a cross of Calvary, right? But the final question remains. Jesus did die on one cross. What shape was it? Some believe it was a simple uh, it was simply a torture stake with no cross piece whatsoever. Well, the English word cross automatically conveys the meaning that two pieces of wood cross each other at some point or angle. But the Greek word from which cross is translated in the New Testament, stauros, does not require this meaning. The word itself simply means an upright stake or post. If the instrument on which Jesus died was no more than this, it was not a quote-unquote cross as such at all. This would clearly show the folly of many types of crosses being Christianized. But, on the other hand, the statement of Thomas about the print of nails, plural, in the hands of Jesus, as we can read in John 20, verse 25, quote, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Unquote. So on the other hand, the statement of Thomas about the print of the nails in the hands of Jesus could indicate that a cross piece was included on the stake, for, in, for on a single stake, his hands would have probably been driven through with one nail. This, coupled with the fact that there was space above his head for the inscription, as we can read in Luke 23, verse 38, quote, and the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews, unquote, would tend to favor what has been termed the Latin cross. Crosses shaped like a T or an X can be eliminated, since these would probably not allow sufficient space above the head for the inscription. As to the exact shape of the cross of Christ, we need not to be concerned. All such arguments fade into insignificance when compared to the real meaning of the cross, not the piece of wood, but the eternal redemption accomplished by the death of Christ on the cross. It is not to worship the cross, it is to worship the Creator. What he accomplished on that cross, that is important. So, don't hang crosses around your neck. Don't tattoo crosses above your body. Don't tattoo anything up across your body anyway, but you know what I mean. Images and idols are all these, and those are an abomination to God already from the beginning of the world, as we can read, of course, in the second commandment. So I'm sorry it took a little bit longer than an hour, but still I think your attention span did not go that far away, huh? I hope at least. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will continue next time with chapter 7 of the book Babylon Mystery Religion, which is called Constantine and the Cross. And there, of course, it gets very, very interesting, I can promise you right now. So, 
I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to do your own research. And until next time, God bless you and keep you in His ways, my brethren, my brothers, my sisters. I love you all. Until the next time, Jokla 66 signing off. God bless you and bye-bye.